everybody doing okay? Thank you, Lawrence. <laughs> All right. It feels good here tonight. I just feel like we're talking and getting along and like a family. It feels good. Um, last week we talked about Proverbs. I won't be continuing that. This will be three individual sermons, not necessarily a series. So today we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 16. Uh, but before that, one verse in Acts chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, I think it'll be on the screen also. Yes? Uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 36 is where we'll start. This will help us get a little bit of background to what we're reading today. It says, After some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit the brothers and sisters in every town where we've preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. All right, so this is the plan. Revisit these places. See how they're doing. What I didn't include here, what comes immediately after this, is that Paul and Barnabas actually had a big dis disagreement about where they're going to go and who they're going to take. So they, it was such a big disagreement that they actually split ways. And Paul chose Silas, and together they went this way, and Barnabas went that way. So I think I want to mention that to you just because these are ordinary people, and it's helpful for us. A and it's actually pretty amazing that it's included here in the scripture. They're not trying to make a big deal out of Paul, and I don't think Paul would make a big deal out of himself. But it's helpful for us to realize these are real, everyday, ordinary people. They had some conflict. And uh, I think that's just helpful to keep in the back of our mind as we go along. So let's go back and visit, and then uh, we'll pick it up in the focus of our time today, Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I will begin with another Proverbs, not about your speech, but Proverbs 16, 9 says that a person's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. There's nothing wrong with making plans. We do this every day. It's wise. But our plans are not the ultimate say, the final decisive voice on what will happen in our life. Actually, the Bible encourages us to make our plans with humility before God. Because there's so many things that are outside of our control. And so we experience interruptions. We experience unexpected events in our lives. And plans change. This happens very often for us. Paul had a plan. We read it in chapter 15. Let's go back to these churches we visited before. See how they're doing. Let's strengthen them. He knew where he wanted to go. He knew what he wanted to do. So he chose Silas, as I mentioned, as his traveling mate. Together they set out to strengthen the churches, it tells us, in Syria and Cilicia. And from Cilicia, they continued on to a place called Derby, where they picked up this guy named Timothy, who had a really good reputation. And Paul said, Timothy, I want you to come with us. And so they continued on from town to town, strengthening the churches. And then in verses 6 and 7, we read something interesting that they continued through the re region of Phrygia in Galatia. But why did they go to that region? It says, well, because they had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. I said, okay. And then they went to Mycenae, and they tried to go into Bithynia in the north. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. That's pretty interesting. You know, up until this point, they're doing exactly what they want to do. The journey is smooth. They're going where they plan to go, doing what they plan to do. But as they set out for Asia, suddenly 
they run into a roadblock. The Holy Spirit forbid them. So they reroute it. Okay, let's, maybe we should go this way. And again, there's a roadblock, a detour. The Spirit did not allow them to go there either. And this leaves us with a few questions. You know, exactly how did the Spirit do this? It could be, it could be a host of things. And it's really not uh, important for us to speculate about it. But they had good intentions. Paul and his companions, they had good intentions. It's a, it's a good thing to want to strengthen churches. But two times they were prevented from doing this in the places where they wanted to go. They were detoured. And so uh, I just want to ask, are any of you at this point, are, do any of you feel anxiety for Paul and Silas and the companions? Are you worried about them? Are you think, well, well guys, what are you going to do now? Where are you going to go? Yeah, I mean, are you just going to turn around and go back home? Is this a wasted trip? Do any of you feel any anxiety for them? Probably not, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're like, Andy, that was a weird question. Yeah, it should be weird. It should be weird. Uh, most of us don't feel anything. And I have a theory about why that is. We don't feel anything because we have the benefit of, what knowing, of knowing what happens next. From the comfort of our seats here at SYME, we can look ahead in the scripture and find out what happens to these guys. We know they'll eventually end up in Macedonia. They'll share Jesus with a woman named Lydia and she'll believe. And then they'll continue to talk about Jesus, but this time they'll get in trouble for it. And Paul and Silas will be beaten and thrown into prison. And then in prison, they won't stay there. God will cause a big earthquake to happen that will break open the prison doors, but they won't run out. Instead, they'll remain there and they'll talk about Jesus with the prison guard and his whole family and all of them will believe. And all of this will take us about one to two minutes to read. Pretty quick from the comfort of our seats here at SYME. But remember, for Paul and his companions, these events are happening in real time. This is real life. They couldn't read ahead in the chapter and find out what's going to happen next. But isn't that what we want in life? We want to know what's going to happen next. We want to eliminate any bad future contingencies. We want to know exactly what is going to happen. And if you're going to put this in Bible language, you might say we want to walk by sight and not by faith. When I was in high school, sometimes on a Saturday, my mom would invite me to go eat breakfast. So we go out somewhere to have breakfast. And of course, I'm a teenager. I never refuse. We go. We'd have a great breakfast. We'd come back home and go on with our day. And we did this a few times. And then one Saturday, she invited me again to go. And of course, yes, absolutely, free food. Uh, but this time, toward the end of our meal, I would say, she said, uh, Andy, while we're out, I have a few errands I need to run. Uh, some of you, I don't, if you're not familiar with, with what an errand is, the way my mom thinks about an errand, this means that we have to go to different stores to look at things and buy things. And as a teenager, I had a strong aversion, a distaste, dislike, bordering hatred for things like errands and shopping and browsing. So for my mom to first secure my commitment to breakfast and then surprise me with errands around town, I felt tricked. <laughs> Bepienla, you know? If I would have known all of this ahead of time, I would have just stayed home and had breakfast. It would have been fine. If I would have only known all of this ahead of time, I could have made a decision that I think would have been better for me. And that's a silly example, but I think that was, that's what was going on in my heart. I wanted full control of everything. I wanted to ensure that I would only do what I wanted to do, nothing less and definitely nothing more. Breakfast only, mom. 
No errands, no shopping, no unexpected detours. Sometimes we relate to God this way. We praise him, we thank him for saving us, and we should. We're amazed by his great love and grace toward us. And we should be amazed. It is amazing. But then, when it comes time for him to call us out on faith, for us to lead us in a certain way, we hesitate. There might be an area of your life, my life, where we have trouble entrusting ourselves to him. Uh, There could be places where we still want full control, where we want to make the rules for how things should be done between us, just like I wanted to make the rules with my mom for how things should happen. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but some of us, we might think something like this. We might want to negotiate with God a little bit and say, okay, Lord, uh, before I follow you, before I go your way, before I step out on faith here, I first need some assurance that, all right, first, number one, we'll only do what I want to do. And then secondly, I need to know ahead of time that this won't interfere with my future plans, because I do have a 10-year plan, or my sense of comfort and security and stability. If you can meet these demands, I mean, sorry, misspoke. If you can meet these conditions, then I'll give you my blessing to lead you to lead me as you please. I understand this. I get it. How can I write something like that? Because maybe I've thought it before. This is not new to me. It may not be new to you. It's a temptation that's as old as the Garden of Eden. When Satan came to Adam and Eve and he tempted them with the possibility of living life independent of God on their own terms making the rules for their own life. And we can hear echoes for this all around us. This is the air we breathe today in 2024. It's as if this voice is still speaking, saying, hey, listen, you can have knowledge of God without submitting to him. Yeah, you can be the master of your own life, the captain of your soul, the leader. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah, be free from God's oppressive rule. You're the only one who knows what will make you happy, so just follow your heart and blaze your own trail. Who could fault you for that? This kind of thinking is all around us. And when we think like this, we're actually exalting ourselves and looking down on God. We're treating him like a social media post. We say, okay, God, when you say this, I'll give you the thumbs up. But when you ask me to do that, that's a big thumbs down, dislike, unfollow. Some of us might be hesitant to follow the Lord because we doubt his goodness. We think there's no way he can be good and still allow all these bad things to happen. We might doubt his wisdom. We might think, I know better than he does. Or we might doubt his love. Some of us might have a hard time believing he loves us maybe we're afraid I've been afraid we might wonder something like if I go this way if I really step out on faith here whatever it might be what will happen to me will I have enough what will happen to the children what if I never get married what if I have to move what if I have to change jobs What if I can't provide for my family? What if I get hurt or sick? What if I have to start over again? I'm so tired of starting over again. But the Lord says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. We might need to hear him say again, listen to him call your name and say, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. You might need to hear him say that again today. He will never leave you. He will never abandon you. Other people will, guaranteed. Yes, people will leave you. 
Yes, people will abandon you, but not him. He will not. The questions we have about uncertain futures or our well-being or stability or security, these are normal questions. I've asked them myself. I've asked them in the past six months. Wait a couple weeks, I might ask them again. But sometimes when we're faced with a situation that requires us to trust God, to step out on faith, we tend to quickly forget about Him and we shift all our focus to our circumstances and we put all the weight and emphasis there and we forget about Him. We forget about what's true. We forget about who He is. So it's important for us to let these truths, the truths of His Word, take deep root in us and shape us to let the words of the Lord disarm our fear. His presence with us and His promises to us really do make all the difference. Paul and his companions were ordinary people, just like us. But I think they were convinced of God's promises and sure of His presence with them wherever they went. Later on in the book of Romans, Paul would put it this way. He would say, I'm persuaded. You might could say, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, rulers, I'm thinking governments, kings, local police, nor things present, nor things to come. This covers all of our hypothetical situations. What if this? What if that? Nor things present, nor things to come. Nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. Quick question. Can you think of a created thing? It can't separate you from the love of God. None of this will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Imagine the worst possible scenario or the best. Imagine anything. Just call something to mind. That will not separate you from the love of Christ. We need to dwell on these truths, not just one time. I can say it today. We can hear it. It's in one ear, out the next. We have to make this, make this a part of our, our life, the rhythm of our life, to continually hear what the Lord says to us. The best is always yet to come for the Christian. The best is always yet to come. And this, for us, when we're thinking about uncertainty or stepping out on faith, trusting God, this should be liberating for us. The best is always yet to come. We will be with Jesus forever. If you're trusting in him today, that is a sure, unshakable, unfading hope. We'll be with Jesus forever. Your future is secure. Not only that, he's with you now. He's involved in your life. We're free to follow him wherever he goes with this sure foundation under our feet. But again, hearing this once is not enough. We have to abide in these things. We have to remind one another of these things. One day I might be weak, but you may be strong, and I need you to remind me. The next day I might be a little stronger, feeling good, and maybe you're down, and I need to remind you. Sometimes we run into detours that test our faith. Paul and his companions, they ran into some detours. In verses 8 through 10, they tried to go here, detour. Tried to go here, Holy Spirit would not allow it. So they continued on, and then something interesting happened. In verse 9, during the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, saying, come over and help us. And after he saw the vision, it says here, we immediately made efforts to set out from Macedonia, concluding that God called us to go preach the gospel to them. So Paul told his companions about the vision, which, as a side note, I think is very wise. He didn't say, hey guys, had this vision, God told me to do something, let's go. No, he consulted with them. I think there's wisdom in that. When we need to make a big decision that requires discernment, it's good to discuss it with other godly people in our life. And even Paul, at least at this time, he decided, yes, I want to bring this up to the fellas and see what they say. And they concluded together, yeah, it seems like the Lord's leading us that way. So let's go. 
They immediately began making preparations to go to make the trip. This is not a trip across town, by the way. This is hundreds of miles from, from mainland to a small island, then from that small island into Macedonia, into Europe. So they are committed. One thing I have asked myself while I was reading this is, how can these guys so quickly and it seems like eagerly abandon their original plans? I mean, they kind of had to, right? They were forbidden. But how can they so quickly just turn and, and go, it seems, to Macedonia? I think part of it is they knew their purpose. Paul knew that he was called to take the gospel to the Gentiles. This is made very clear throughout the New Testament. Later on in the book of Acts, he'll even give his testimony. He'll say, listen, I don't count my life as worth, of, worth any kind of value as long as I can finish the race that the Lord Jesus gave me. Like to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That's, that's the call that he gave me. That is my mission. I think this continually compelled Paul to go and preach the gospel to those who had never heard about Jesus. And I think his companions, Silas, Timothy, maybe Luke a little later on, I think they shared this same conviction. We want to see the good news of Jesus go to new places to spread. And so when Paul had this vision, they concluded, okay, sounds good. Let's go. Let's go to Macedonia and preach the gospel there. But besides that, they don't really have a lot of details. That's one thing we talked about this at small group, this passage, and one thing we said was, yeah, there's not a whole lot of details. It doesn't mean they didn't know, or maybe they didn't have details either, but at least for us, we're thinking, all right, well, what's your travel itinerary? What route are you going to take? Did you Google it? I mean, how long is this going to take? What are you going to do when you get there? How are you going to support yourself? What's the plan? What's the strategy? Here's what they know. Go to Macedonia. Preach the gospel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the plan, but what's the strategy? Uh, the strategy is go to Macedonia and preach the gospel. So they went, not knowing what would happen when they got there. Do you know what that's called? That's called faith. They fixed their eyes on the Lord and they moved forward by faith in him. Not based on intel they got ahead of time. Not based on a Google search that they did. No. All they knew was go there and preach the gospel. They knew God. They didn't know Macedonia, but they knew God. They entrusted their lives and their plans and their future to him. Could you do that? Can you and I trust God simply based on what we know about him? We might say, well, I don't know much about that place. I don't know much about that school. I don't know much about that city or that new job, but Lord, I know you. I know you're with me. I know you won't leave me. I know you're not against me. From their perspective, these events are all unexpected detours. But from God's perspective, this is the plan. He's not making things up as he goes. There's no plan B. He has his plan. And right here, we see it unfold before our eyes. This is all part of the big picture of Acts. God moves his messengers into new places so that those who've never heard about Jesus can hear about him and what he's done. Do you remember Acts chapter 1, verse 8? It's a more well-known scripture. This is Jesus has died, he has risen, and he is about to ascend. But before he does that, he tells his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth being fulfilled right here before our eyes. From Antioch to Derby where Timothy is. 
try to go to Bithynia in the north? Nope. And then over to Troas. They get a boat from Troas to go to Samothrace. From there, they get another boat to go into Macedonia, into Europe. And they're taking the gospel with them the whole time into new places. The gospel moves from Asia to Europe. It's in Africa. Eventually it came, we have 18 that I know of, 18 nationalities represented here today. Maybe not today, but at TIFF. Eventually it came to your country and to mine, to your city, to your people. Then to someone who knows you. And then from their mouth to your ears, the gospel came. And you believed it. And by God's grace, you were saved. And this is how the gospel spreads. From one mouth to one ear, and on and on it goes. This is a theme throughout the book of Acts. God works in amazing and unexpected ways so that the gospel can go forward, that people from all nations might put their hope in Jesus. One of my first, uh, it was my first supervisors when we lived in China, my first supervisors, he said something makes a lot of sense now. He said, I find that in my life, God often works through interruptions. So I'm always very sensitive to interruptions in my daily life. Now what I did not just say is that every interruption is a sign from God. What I did just say is that this person said something wise. It's up to you to use discernment with how to use it. But I found that to be true as well. God often works in unexpected ways. Ways that we would have never designed for ourselves. It wasn't my design to come to Taiwan. God worked in some very unexpected ways to bring us here to Taichung. But he does this. And he's doing so many things. He's doing so many things in us. He's doing so many things around us in the process. And then he's doing things through us. So what does this tell us about God? Every time we read the Bible, this is a good question to ask. The Bible is a book about God. What does this tell us about God? There's two things that I can think of. It, one is that his plan is for his glory to be revealed all over the earth. Habakkuk 2.14, it says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the waters cover the sea. Think about the oceans on planet earth. It says God's glory will be revealed all over the earth, just like the waters cover the earth. Again, in Isaiah 45, 22, God himself speaks and he says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. Acts 1, 8, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Hundreds of years before that, in the book of, of Isaiah, God is saying, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. His plan is for his glory to be revealed all over the earth. Secondly, what else does it tell us about God? He loves the world. He loves the world. Listen, it's still true that Jesus loves you. It's still true. It's still true that he cares about the people of the world. He cared about the people of Macedonia at this time. He cares about the people of Taiwan of Taichung, of your hometown. He cares about the people all around us. And so he puts you and he puts me in a particular place, in a particular school, in a particular job. You don't have to cross the ocean like Paul. He might have you exactly where he wants you right now to be a light for his name, to be a witness for his name to the people around you. This is the heart of God, to seek after people to save them, to leave the 99 sheep behind, to go after the one that ran away, and then when he finds him, he'll take him, he'll put him on his shoulders, and joyfully bring him back home where he belongs. Is that you today? Are you like a lost sheep? Do you know Jesus? That's the question I'm asking. Are you wondering what he's all about? After this, or toward the end, there might be a QR code where you can respond or you just come talk to one of us. We would love to talk more with you about who Jesus is 
There is no one greater. You'll never know anyone greater. One big question for us um, might have relevance to us today is what can we do to become the kind of people who would follow the Lord wherever he leads? Right? Paul and his companions, they just picked up and they, they redirected. How can we be like that? How can we cultivate a deeper trust in the Lord just to follow him wherever he leads? Well, there's four things I'd like to suggest. One is we do it by abiding in him. We do it by resting in his sovereignty, by remembering his promises, and then by trusting his wisdom and doing what he says. Four things. So first, by abiding in him. I think Paul and his companions were sensitive to the Lord. They were probably daily in prayer. They knew the scripture. And so their minds and their hearts were trained to know the voice of God. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And when I speak, they know. They can discern between my voice and someone else's voice. And so we have to abide in him. We have to stay close to him. Jesus said it, abide in me. Remain in me, stay close to me. In Matthew 6, it tells us to seek his kingdom first. Continually seek after him. A friend of mine, a pastor friend, he puts it this way. He says, our faith needs constant fuel. Our faith needs constant fuel. We quickly run on empty. We can't rely on Sunday's fuel to keep us going through the week. We need constant fuel. And we can't know the Lord apart from his word. We can't discern his voice if we don't know what his voice sounds like. And it's, and it's very hard to trust him if we don't know him very well. It's hard to trust a stranger. So we need to abide in him. Secondly, rest in his sovereignty. In Isaiah 45, what I read a minute ago, God himself said, I am God and there is no other. If you belong to him, it should give you great comfort. He's in control. He's the king of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things. Nothing can frustrate him. Nothing can frustrate his purposes from coming to pass. That's something that would be helpful to think about. Nothing can stop him. When your plans don't work out, when my plans don't work out, it doesn't mean his plans aren't working out. Like I said, part of the reason we're in Taiwan is because our plans didn't work out. But it doesn't mean God's plans didn't work out. Rest in God's sovereign care for you. He loves you. He's not against you. One pastor puts it this way. He says, there is no power in the universe that can stop God from fulfilling his totally good plans for you. His intentions toward you are for your ultimate good. I say ultimate. Will we have trouble? Yes, we will have trouble. Pain? Yes. Disappointment? Absolutely. But those don't have the final word. God is working these things for your ultimate good. He's promised to do good to us in the end, even if we have to go through those dangers, toils, and snares. He's still leading us. So we abide in him. We rest in his sovereignty. Third, we remember his promises. I've repeated this many times today. Remember his promises. Promises like, if God is for us, who can be against us? Promises like, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So whether I live or whether I die, I'm the Lord's. Or what, like we heard when Todd was preaching through Romans, all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. We have an inseparable union with Jesus. We've got to remember his promises and hide them down in our heart. And lastly, how can we be the kind of people who would follow the Lord wherever he goes to trust him? Well, we listen to his wisdom. We trust his wisdom and we do what he says. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart. 
and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Was he directing Paul and Silas' path? Yes. Yes, absolutely. In that passage, I don't think God's name comes up, but he is definitely working. He is directing their path. When we trust God's wisdom, here's what we say in our heart. We say, you know better. For some of us, that might be hard. We say, you know better, and I trust you. And then we do what he says. Andrew mentioned this earlier. We want to not just be a listener of the word or an understander of the word, but also a doer of the word. Faith is like a muscle. It's got to be exercised. I've talked about this with my wife before. It seems like when I was young, <laughs> I first went overseas when I was young before I was married. And at that time, I, I felt like I could go anywhere and do anything, and I was not afraid. I knew the risks. I heard about them ahead of time. And I thought, yes, I know them, and I'm going anyway. But over time, I think that faith has shrunk in me because of various factors. But I think sometimes we train ourselves for comfort and we stop exercising that muscle of faith in our daily life. We train ourselves to be fixed and comfortable and stable. And we might be missing out on something better. So we need to exercise our faith. This is how we actually become stronger. And it might not mean get on a boat and go across the ocean. It might just mean for you, pick up the phone and give that person a call. It might mean say hello to that person that you get vegetables from. Usually it's just a transaction. Today, I'm going to say hey to them. Maybe it's going across the hallway and hanging out with somebody. Maybe it's grieving with someone who's grieving or doing a good deed for someone, blessing them with your words like we talked about last week. For some of us, that might be a little step of faith. But as we, as we take these, I think we'll exercise that muscle and over time, we'll develop endurance and greater strength. And we'll learn we can trust the Lord. I'm, o I'm still okay. And even if I'm not okay, I'm still going to be okay. You can trust him. We may not see the big picture right now. In fact, we don't. I know we don't. You don't. I don't. We can't. We don't have access to the big picture. We would love it, wouldn't we? We would love to know the end of the story. We would love to know at this time next year, what am I going to be doing? And then I can start making plans for it now. Or five years from now, ten years from now. We just don't have access to all of that. We may not know all that God's up to or what he's doing when he points us in a new direction. But there are some things we can be sure of. He loves you. His promises are sure. His wisdom is good. And he is in control. So, you and I, we're free. I hope this produces a sense of liberation and freedom. We're free to follow him wherever he leads. To put faith in action in our daily lives. And to share the gospel as we go. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we need, um, well, we, we confess, I confess, we just, sometimes we have trouble trusting you. And it uh, may not make sense a lot of times because you've proved yourself over and over again. We can read the Bible. We can see how you proved yourself to others. We can sing about your great salvation, how you proved your love for us and sending Jesus for us. And we still 
we really have trouble sometimes just trusting you. Please help us. Um, we want to really believe sincerely that you don't work against us, that you really do have our best interest in mind, and that you really do love us. And uh, you really are involved in our daily life, and you care for us more than anyone else. And that we can trust you with our lives and with our futures. And um, I don't know how you're going to do that. I can't do that. I feel like it's hard for me to do that for myself. So we need your help. And I pray that for each person here today. That we would see you again. And look a little less at our circumstances and put our eyes more on you. And we pray this in Jesus' name.